Thank you, thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a blessing to be here today. And um, I have a request for us. Is that okay? Uh, do all the men want to stand up first or the ladies first? Who wants to stand up first? The ladies? Okay, interesting. Uh, the lady, okay, Rosemary stood. So, okay, the ladies are standing. Ladies, are you able to help me stand for all the ladies to stand? Is that okay? Okay, good. What about the men? The men can stand as well? Okay, sounds good. So here's a favor to ask. Is it okay for all of us to actually move over here? <laughs> we can do that? Uh, just move this way over here. That'll be much more exciting. Uh, so that uh, we can actually be together. Uh, and anybody else walking through the door, CK, welcome. Anybody else, keep on coming in this way. Um, all right, so move this way. Ruth, don't go that way. This is the direction. No, this way, making a turn around is a good idea. Yeah. CK, we're moving everybody this way. That's what's happening. That's why they're standing. Actually, they're waiting for you. You're punishing them right now. <laughs> the sooner you get here, the sooner they sit, you see? All right, all right. I, I really pray and hope that the rest of the saints, wherever they are, they will not be as delayed, but will be here so that we can be blessed together. But because... Uh, Pastor Klein is, is on our also a tight schedule. We want to be sure we begin on time. Now, are you okay to sit now? Ah, oh, beautiful. I love that. You know, we talked about sometimes how we live our lives and not just to live our life for ourselves. Uh, there is a blessing when we get to share what we know about Christ with others. And so, so I am grateful that Elder Klein has agreed to come to speak on this subject of living an evangelistic life, how we can live our lives so that we can have those practical relationships that we get to build. And I'm praying that for those of us who are here, those who will be coming later, we can get to grow in this so that in our district, we can be very focused on growing and not just saying, hey, we had a good time at church. We need to find a way to tell somebody, we need to come and be a part of this. You know, that's something we need to do. Uh, Pastor Kleinis, I am grateful for your willingness to come. And we want to say a prayer with you and for you so that God may guide you as you do this for us. Let's pray. Father, as we get to begin, we humbly now pray for the leading and anointing of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for Elder Kleinis being here. And Father, for all the other friends, just make a way for them to arrive here also in good time so that our fellowship will be rich and we'll be able to grow in the joy of knowing you and being able to share about you to others. Bless your servant as he speaks. May his words be clear to us and help us to grow in understanding. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor, welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elvis. Let me get this mic turned on. Okay, am I on? I pressed the button. At least I think I did. Are we good? That means on, right? There we go. I can hear myself. All right. Good afternoon, Hope Community. And actually, I'm understanding, are there, are there other churches here represented besides Hope Community? Is West Wilmington? We've got a West Wilmington? Okay. And then Life in Christ? Is there a Life in Christ or MOT church here? So we got Hope and we got West Wilmington. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. There was a miscommunication about time. I was thinking it was 2.30 and it was 3. I need to leave at 5 um, because my daughter is involved in something at Spencerville Academy and I need to get home in time to be able to get her uh, to that. So what we're going to do, we're going to go as far as we can. We'll, we'll cover whatever material we're able to do until 4.45 and then we'll probably have to stop. Uh, this is six sessions long anyway. I wasn't intending that we we're going to do six sessions in one afternoon. Uh, if we just get through one, that will be sufficient. And then since we're all in the same conference, we can come back together again anyway at a later time. Is that okay? Can you hear you say amen? Okay. Also, I got one little problem. It's not a problem for me. I hope it's not a problem for you. I got to the church I was speaking at this morning. I was over at Blythdale. And I got out of my car and realized <laughs> I forgot my suit coat. And so fortunately, that doesn't bother Blythdale. So is it okay with you? I have no suit coat. So can I still talk to you? Okay, because it's, I, I was going to do it anyway. It's not like I can create a suit coat out of nothing. 
So, no, well, I, I, I'm happy like this. <laughs> I wasn't even going to wear a tie, to be honest with you, but when I forgot my suit coat, I thought to myself, okay, I better not push my luck. <laughs> what we're going to do this afternoon, this is really a training session. Living an Evangelistic Life is actually six sessions long. I'm going to put the six on the screen. We're probably just going to get through session one today. This is not meant to be a monologue. In other words, I'm not preaching. I did that at 11 a.m. What this is going to be, think of this as a small group discussion like a big Sabbath school. I'm going to throw out questions to you that I actually want you to, to answer. Uh, you're welcome to make comments and questions. I think, uh, I'm assuming all these mics are here because they're roving mics because I don't need three, you know, three mics. So I'm going to actually sit these here. And at times, I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation on the screen, and I'm going to ask you to talk to the person next to you about how you would apply that principle that you just learned in the situation that's on the screen. So this is meant to be very, very practical, okay? So let me have a word of prayer, and then we need to go right into it. Heavenly Father, you have placed us in places where there are people who don't know you. You allow people to cross our path every day in our neighborhoods, in our schools, our workplaces, even in our families. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you. And, Father, as we go through these principles from your scriptures, from the spirit of prophecy, Lord, show us how we can apply them in the places where you have put us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to start by asking you a question right away. If I were to ask you to describe Jesus' method of ministry, what would you say? If I were to ask you, what made Jesus' ministry different from that of the Pharisees? Why did they flock to Jesus and not to the Pharisees? What made him different? What would some of your answers be? Just go ahead and call it. Okay, inclusivity. That's fine, I'm going to quote it next, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Acceptance versus condemnation. What else? Remember, small group means we have to talk to each other. What made his ministry different? Can you give me some examples? Yes. No, her. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had your hand up. For the mic. <laughs> okay. Can you give me some examples from Scripture, maybe stories, of where Jesus spent time with someone that the Pharisees would not have? Give me some. In the back. Hello? Oh, just talk loud. Uh, at the well with the water. Say it again. The woman at the well. The woman at the well. Actually, that's what I preached on this morning. Okay. Very good. Any, any other stories? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Others should come to your mind. I can think the of The lepers. Others. Lazarus, okay. Okay. What were you going to say? I said the lepers. The lepers? Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking tax collectors. Of one, tax collectors. Yes, that's what I was thinking of. Zacchaeus. Because the Pharisees would never have been found dead in the house of a tax collector. All of these are the things that made Jesus' ministry different. So now, I'm going to put on the screen how Ellen White describes Jesus' way of reaching people in three simple sentences. This is what she writes. 
Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. She describes Jesus' way of doing ministry in five different ways, five steps. Can you name those steps for me? And it should be easy because I color-coded them. <laughs> so what is it? Step number one, mingled with people, showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their, ministered to their needs, won their confidence. Then what? He bade them follow me. So let's put all five of them on the screen, okay? This is what she lists. And they are all good things. But the problem is, many times in our churches, we go right to step number five without doing the first four. And we wonder why we don't get the results that we are hoping for. So now I'm going to throw out to you a question. Now there's no right or wrong answer to it. This is strictly an opinion question. Of those five steps that are listed on the screen, in your opinion, which one do you think we struggle with the most as a church? Which of those five? And again, this is just opinion. You can pick any of the five that you want. Which one do you think we struggle with the most? Mingle with men. Okay, I hear a mingling with men. Show sympathy. Show sympathy. Anybody else? Ministering to their needs. So far we've had what we have the first three. In fact, let's take a vote. How many would say we struggle with the first one, mingling with people? Let me see your hands. Okay, how many would say we struggle with the second one, showing sympathy? All right, how about number three, ministering to their needs? Okay, hands are all up. Number four, winning confidence and friendship. Okay, I'm fine. Number five, inviting them to follow him. Okay, he, Elvis says all. Now, I'll tell you my opinion. My opinion's no better than yours. It's just my opinion. The one I think we struggle with the most tends to be number one. And the reason I say that is this. Some of us have perhaps been brought up with the attitude that says, I can't be friends with people who don't know Jesus. I can't spend time with someone who's not a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist because their life may corrupt mine. After all, the Bible says not to be of the world so I must separate myself from the world around me. And that's called a separation mentality. It is also the very reason why the Jewish nation never fulfilled the purpose that God had for them. Because when, God, when the Bible says, now Jesus did say not to be of the world, but why is it we only quote that part? He also said we are in the world, but not of the world. Now to not be of the world does not mean that I ignore people in the world. It doesn't mean that I don't associate with people who don't know Jesus. To not be of the world means that I reject the belief systems of the world, I reject the immoral actions, uh, activities of the world, but not the people. Because you can't win someone to Jesus that you're not spending time with. If that makes sense, can you say amen? Because if not being of the world means that I can't spend time with people who don't know Jesus, then the question is, well, why did Jesus spend time with the most unlikely people? Mary Magdalene? I mean, you named them. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Matthew, who became one of his <coughs> disciples. I mean, we could go on down the list. Jesus spent time with those people. People who were not exactly high on the list as far as spirituality was concerned. And so for many of us, we think, oh, I cannot be friends with people who don't know Jesus, and that's a problem for us. Because we don't know how to mingle with people who aren't in the church. We don't know how to become friends with someone who's got a completely different worldview than we do. And so therefore, all our friends are Christian, maybe all our friends are Seventh-day Adventists, and that, that's a problem. Because God has called us to mingle with the people of the world. Not to do what they do, not to compromise anything, but if Jesus can go into the parties of the tax collectors, maybe there is somebody in my world that doesn't know Jesus that God is calling me to connect and to be friends with. Because think about it. 
How in the world am I going to fulfill the gospel commission if I am separating myself from the very people that God has called me to reach? See, sometimes as Christians and even Adventists, we like to do ministry and evangelism from a distance. We don't mind throwing out doctrine, throwing out prophecy, throwing out good biblical information. We're fine with that. But at some point, if I'm going to be a soul winner, I've got to be willing to come down from my pulpit and actually engage and connect and become friends with people personally. Because there is a difference between a lecturer and a soul winner. There is a difference. Because the only way I can be a soul winner is to reach the heart of the person. So, number one. But the truth is, number one through four, they're all interconnected anyway. Because numbers one through four requires me to do just what I said to actually engage and connect with people. And we tend to struggle with that. Now, of the five, another opinion question, which one do you think we like the most as a church? Number five. Number five. So sympathy. <laughs> I would tend to agree. My favorite is number five. Because I like to see people making decisions for Jesus. I love to see baptisms. I understood. I understand you had a baptism today here in Hope. Is that right? Last week. Last week and some others who have made decisions. I love baptisms. I love to see the results of working with people. But the problem is I don't get to number five if I haven't done the first four. So when a church says, hey, let's do evangelism this year, it's a rather confusing statement to me because when they say, let's do evangelism this year, I'm thinking, what do you mean, let's do it this year? <laughs> we do it every year. But what a church typically means is let's hold a set of evangelistic meetings, and we call that evangelism. Now, I am an evangelist. I believe strongly in public evangelism, and I do not believe any of these ideas that say it's irrelevant, that it doesn't work anymore, because I've watched it work for 25 years when it's done right with a, with a cycle of evangelism. But many times our churches will spend a lot of time, a lot of money on a set of meetings, don't get the results they want, and they wonder why, when the truth is we haven't done the first four steps. The real question is not what am I doing during the four weeks of, a, of an evangelistic series, but what have I been doing the other 48 weeks out of the year? Do I have a cycle? Do I have ministries where I'm building relationships with the community? Do I have Bible studies going? Are we connecting with people and, and building an interest list? Because if I'm not doing that, I have no one to invite to the evangelistic meetings. So, of course, I'm not going to get the results. Higher cycle. Does that make sense? That's right. And it, it, she basically describes it with these five steps. So with that... Let me give you an example, this idea of mingling with people. Because this is so basic that really, do, do you know that the first step of soul win is the same in every culture, every language group, every people, every country around the world. It is no different in any culture. The first step is always, always, always the same. And guess what that first step is? friendship, connecting with people. After the friendship, the methods may change in different cultures and different countries, but the first step is the same. Because you will never win someone to Jesus who doesn't trust you first. And the only way to gain trust is, guess what? You've got to spend time with people. It's the science of soul winning. So let me give you a hypothetical situation. Oh, by the way, those five things that are listed on the screen, I'm going to ask you a trick question. You're going to think this is a trick question. And the truth is, it is a trick question. All those things listed on the screen, could you call those things evangelism, yes or no? Yes. Why not? I'm hearing two different answers. Yes. I heard yes. yes. I heard no. Let's take a vote. How many say, I, I think they could, yeah, yes, yes, they could be evangelists. Okay, how many people say, no, I don't know if I'd call that evangelism. Let me see your hand. Okay, we got, we got both sides. The truth of the matter is, yes, you could call those things evangelism if 
You're doing it from the purpose of being able to build a friendship with someone that doesn't know Jesus. You could call that evangelism. Because evangelism isn't just holding meetings. That's a part of it, the part that I like, but it's not the only part. So to give an example of how we sometimes struggle, I want you to pretend that your neighbor has come to you and said, hey, I want to invite you to my backyard tomorrow. We're going to have a neighborhood barbecue in my yard, and I want to invite you to come. If we're brutally honest with each other, as a Seventh-day Adventist, what's the first thing that goes through my mind? Come on, we, we got to be honest to learn. Okay, what, 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 oh my goodness, they might eat meat, oh, they might serve alcohol, oh, they might do this. That's the first thing that goes through our mind. And then maybe because of that, we choose not to go and we miss the opportunity that God is giving us to connect with our neighbors. Now, is it possible they might serve food that you don't eat? That's possible. Maybe you're a vegetarian. They're probably, they're probably not. Does that mean that I shouldn't go to the barbecue? Oh, you were quiet, huh? You're not you worrying me. <laughs> I can eat the other things. If I'm a vegetarian, I can eat the corn on the cob. I can eat the salad. Is it possible that they might serve a Bud Light? Yes. That's possible. What can you drink? Water, lemonade, some, something else. Why should I let that keep me from the opportunity that God may be giving me to mingle with my neighbor? Now, if the neighbor goes inside and watches something on television, an R-rated movie that maybe I shouldn't, that doesn't mean that I'm going to go in and do that just to connect. There is a line that you have to draw somewhere. But I can't miss the opportunity to at least go to the barbecue and connect with my neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. Because if I'm not going to go to his barbecue, guess what? He ain't going to your church right. when you invite him. Let's just be plain and simple. I've got to be willing to connect. So with that, you say, why do we do this then? Why do I build a friendship? It's not like if I build a friendship, it's not like they're going to ask me to give them Bible studies a week later. It's not like they're going to get baptized in a month. So why do I do this? Because truthfully, when it comes to friendship evangelism, it's usually a long-term investment, isn't it? You're not going to see results right away. You may not see results for a year, two years, five years, if it's family, maybe even longer. But the reason we do this is this principle. As you build a friendship, you will be the one they come to when they do have spiritual questions. Because if they have learned to trust you, if you have built a trusting friendship, if you have not been one that just beats them over the head with different things, when the time finally comes, they will ask you spiritual questions. You say, Hannah, how do you know that? Are you a prophet? No, I'm not a prophet, but I know life. Life has a way of bringing things across our path that would make a seemingly secular person consider spiritual things, at least for a short time. In fact, let's talk about that. What are some things that could happen to a person that might cause them to think about spiritual things when they weren't before? Loss of a loved one. I mean, there's a hundred things. What else? Illness. An illness or a sickness you have no control over. Loss of a job. Keep going. Okay. Anything else? A broken relationship. Marriage. A broken relationship. A marriage falling apart or a divorce. I mean, if you've lived long enough, you know. Life has a way of bringing things across our path that start to make us think a little differently. And so when those things happen, and they will in this sinful world, if I have developed a friendship with that person and they know that I'm a, a Christian, that they know that I'm a spiritual person, very likely I will be the one that they come to with those spiritual questions because I've earned their trust. In every person's life, there will be a window of opportunity no matter how unlikely of a person they might seem like from the outside. Because the Bible says that God has placed eternity 
in the heart of every person. And so there's something that's going to happen in their life that's going to bring that out. So let me share a study with you, and then I want to give you some, some principles and some practice here. I want to share a study with you that, to me, underscores the importance of friendship, connecting with people in this first step. It's a study that was done, oh, probably 30 or more years ago, but I believe it's still relevant today. And in this study, uh, at Andrews University, they, they studied three groups of people. The first group were those who came into the church and quickly dropped out, and unfortunately, we've probably all seen that happen. The second group were those who never made a decision. They weren't positive, nor were they negative towards the church. They just never made a decision. And the third group were those who became active, longtime members. And when they surveyed each group, the results were interesting. Let's take a look at the first group. This was the group that came in and quickly dropped out. They discovered that 71% of that group was approached with the truth by someone exerting what? Pressure. pressure. Someone exerting pressure. Now, let me throw out to you. Why do you think that pressured decisions don't usually last? No choice. No choice? It wasn't their choice? The, the what? The pressure is for a moment. It's not, temp it's not permanent. I mean, think about it. How do people normally respond to pressure? There are about two or three ways that people respond to pressure. What is it? Hi, Keem. How do people respond to pressure? Okay, they give in or give up. In other words, they get as far away from you as they can or they fight back. Th think of a time when you experience pressure, even, even, in the, even in the secular world. Do you enjoy being pressured by people? No. Do you love to spend time with someone who pressures you? No. Of course not. So why in the world would we think it's any different in the religious world? Now see, there, there's a difference between pressuring someone and being bold for Jesus. I can be bold and ask the bold question. But the difference is, and we don't have time to go into it in depth today, but the difference is relationship. Before I can be bold with someone, i got to earn the right to do that. And you earn the right through trusting friendship. That's why I'm guessing, do you have some people in your life who can say things to you that other people can't get away with? Oh, yes. It's probably someone you trust, right? Like my wife. She can say things to me that if you said it to me, it would probably tick me off <laughs> because she has earned the right to be able to do that. It, it's the same when it comes to soul winning. I, I remember one of the times I experienced pressure in my life. I'll never forget it. Marquita and I were newly married, and we took one of our first vacations in Daytona Beach, Florida. <laughs> well, while we're walking along the beach at, at Daytona, some guy comes running up to us with a flyer and says, hey, would you like to get a free $30 meal at the Olive Garden? You know, and being younger and naive, and we thought, oh, well, yeah, sure, I'd love to take my wife to a nice romantic meal. And he answers a flyer and says, look, all you got to do is go to this hotel tomorrow morning, just listen to a presentation, you don't have to buy anything, just listen to it, and you'll get a free $30 gift certificate to the Olive Garden. And so being foolish, we went to it. Now, those of you with more experience, then you probably realize, what did we walk into? A timeshare presentation. I remember they sat us down, I don't know, for a half hour, 45 minutes or so, showed us a wonderful video of how nice it would be to own a timeshare. That you could trade your timeshare with people all over the world, take your spouse to five-star accommodations, how great it would be. And then, when the, when the uh, video was over, then they took each couple and sat them down at a round table by themselves and a salesperson came to each round table. I ain't never going to forget the guy who came to our table. <laughs> he sat down and he said, ah, wasn't that wonderful? And we had to agree, well, yeah, it's really nice, really nice. And he writes down a number and says, would you buy it for this amount? No, we can't afford that. 
He crosses it out, writes down another number. Ha. Uh -uh. Crosses it out, writes another number. Can you buy it for this? I'm like, no. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, why don't you just give me the right number the first time? <laughs> because if I would have said yes to the first highest number, do you think he would have sold it to me for that? Yeah. Sure he would have. And so we explained to him, look, we think we might be going into ministry. It hadn't happened yet, but we had a sense that it was going to. I said, it's not really something that we can afford right now. We can't commit to this right now financially. You think he took no for it? In fact, he kept going on and pressing us. And then finally, when he wasn't getting anywhere, he used the shame tactic. Now, you know what I mean when I say the shame tactic? This is what he says to me. He looks at me. He looks at me and says, so where do you have your wife staying now? Where are you and your wife staying? <laughs> now, I don't, I don't remember exactly where we were. It was like the days in. It certainly wasn't a five-star accommodation. Hey, it's what we could afford that, you know? So I say, we're at the day's end. And he looks at me and he says, wouldn't you like to be able to take your wife to these five-star accommodations instead of the dump where you have her now? That's what he said to me. And you, he's, he is insinuating that I can't provide nice things for my newly wedded wife. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. On the outside, I'm a Christian. But inside, he's starting to tick me off now. He's, he's starting to make me mad. And so finally it got to the point where we just had to be firm with the guy and just say, look, we're not interested. We can't afford it. We're not buying it. I'm sorry. Boy, did he get mad. He jumped out of that seat and started yelling at us. He said, all you people do is come for the free gifts. You never intend on buying everything. You never intend on buying anything. That's not right. That's not fair. And he walked away from us yelling. Never gave me the $30 gift certificate. So after about an hour and a half of that, I turned to Marquis and I said, I'm getting my gift certificate. And so I walked around that place until I found my gift certificate and we had our $30 meal at the Olive Garden. <laughs> Amen. Now my point is, even if that guy would have offered me the timeshare for free, I wouldn't have taken it from him. Simply because I didn't trust him. And the fact that he, he didn't bother to build a relationship, he didn't ask questions about our, he just had one thing in mind, and that was to sell it and make a buck. And I, I knew that. I was a number to him. So if that's the way it is in the secular world, why would it be any different in the religious world? See, if I'm having to pressure someone, that usually means I'm not doing something else. If I'm pressuring them, what am I not doing, probably? Building the relationship. Seeking to connect with the person. When you have that, you don't need to pressure. And that's how 71 of these people were approached. Second group. These were people who never made a decision. They weren't negative towards the church. They weren't pod. They just, they just never made a decision. They didn't have an attitude with the church. They didn't have anything against it. They just never made a decision. And when they surveyed this group, they discovered that 84% of them <laughs> were approached by someone who just presented them with information, the right information. You follow me what I'm saying? Basically, the attitude was, Okay, here's the truth. Here's the 28 fundamental beliefs. If you believe it, that's great. That's wonderful. If you don't believe it, well, I told you the truth. The blood's off my hands. Now, nobody would probably say that. Well, some people might. But most people wouldn't say that. But sometimes that might be the attitude. We think if I just give people the right information, that's all they need to make a decision. That might have been true 70 years ago when the culture was a little more Christian in nature, but it's not true today. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to give them the right information. We need to share correct biblical doctrine. Don't get me wrong. But a person needs more than that to make a decision. Let me illustrate it by something that happened in my life. When I first became a pastor... I was in the Pennsylvania Conference and I had a three church district in western Pennsylvania. Well, one of the churches that I was given closed two months after I got there. Isn't that real good for a resume? 
Uh, but basically, I inherited a church that just refused to worship with each other. I'm not going to go into detail. They just refused to worship with each other. And the president asked them, look, I'm giving you a date where we're going to come together at the church and we're going to work this out. If you don't come together, we can't keep your church. There's nothing we can do. Amazingly, they did not come together, even though they knew they were going to lose their church, so they lost their church. Bottom line is, then the church wanted to add, a distra, add another church to my district. And so very early on, when I started going to this church, I met a couple. And I remember this, this couple, uh, she had grown up in the church, had left it in her young adult years. During that time, she got married to a Catholic police officer. They had children together. And so now she was sensing a need to come back to church. And so she was coming to church, and her husband came with her along with their kids. And so eventually, I started having Bible studies with the Catholic police officer because he, he was very open. And it's interesting, as, as we were studying together, he was, he was accepting everything. There was just one thing he was having a little problem with, and it's, it's, not, it's not the doctrine you would normally think. You want to guess which one it is? There was, there was just one he was having a problem with. Take a guess. No drinking. What is it? No drinking. You heard this story before, didn't you? Yes. Did you hear this story before in one of my things? Nobody ever gets it on the first guess. He's got it right. It was alcohol. And you know what shocked me? He didn't drink. He didn't drink anyway. I'm like, why is he having a problem with this? He doesn't drink. I don't know if he thought that he couldn't spend time with his friends who do, but it was bought. So anyway, we just went on to the Bible studies. I figured, okay, he accepts everything else, so I'm just going to let God take care of it. Let's just go on with the Bible studies. And so we did. Then one night... He and I went out to play basketball together. We went to play basketball with some of his friends. Which, by the way, when you're doing Bible studies with people, every time you get together, it doesn't have to be for a Bible study. You can actually do things together. Now, I'm not saying skip the Bible study all the time, but you can actually go do things and build a relationship. That's part of soul winning. That's why Ellen White says that soul winning is a science. It's not just presenting information. So Pat and I said his name, Pat. Pat and I went and played basketball. And on the way home, somehow we got into a discussion of how I played basketball in high school. And I was telling him how I went to a Christian high school, but it wasn't an Adventist high school. And so when I got on the varsity basketball team, all their games were guess when. It was Friday night or Saturday afternoon. And so I had told the coach, I said, look, I'm not going to be able to play on those days. And the coach looked at me and said, well, go get your preacher to give you permission to play. <laughs> and I, I'm like, you don't know the Adventist church real well, do you? Because <laughs> it doesn't work like that. I, I don't need to ask for permission. Number one, if I want to play, I'll play. It's my decision. I don't need to ask anybody. And then he says to me, well, I know your preacher. He gave other of your kids permission to play. And that's when I knew he was lying to me. Because <laughs> trust me, I know the church I grew up in. I grew up in a conservative church. There's no way the preacher would have said, yeah, go ahead and play. It's okay. Now, he might have said, look, it's your decision. You know, you, know, you know what God says, but it's your decision. I can't make it for you. Now, he might have said that, and I would agree with that. But I know he didn't say, yeah, just go ahead and play. So I eventually quit the varsity team because I could see this was going to be a problem. And when I told that to Pat in the car as we're driving home, he looks at me and says, wow, Dave, I know how much you, like ba you love basketball. That must have been a hard decision. Well, if you can do that, if you can make that decision for Jesus, then I'm going to make mine. And he chose to be baptized. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute here, okay. <laughs> what, what just happened? We weren't even talking about alcohol. Where did the decision for baptism come from? I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. See, I had given Pat all the right information. I gave him all the verses about alcohol and everything else. I gave him the right information, but he needed more than that. He needed my friendship. He needed me to spend time with him. He needed me to share my story with him. He needed to hear bits and pieces of my testimony. And so when we get involved in a person's life, that's what got him over the hump to actually making the decision for Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. 
you got to go beyond information. And then finally, the last group, those who became active longtime members. Not surprisingly, <laughs> when they were interviewed, 94% were approached by someone who dialogued with them, showed an interest in them, and gave them what? Friendship. That is one of the biggest parts of soul winning, is connecting with people. That is why you can have someone who's got a PhD from the seminary, has everything up here, but they can't win a soul to Jesus because they don't know how to connect with the heart. And you can have someone who barely has an eighth grade education and they've won 50 people to Jesus because they know how to connect with somebody's heart. So let me share three principles with you. You're going to apply some of these. Number one, the three big principles of personal evangelism agree with people how often? Whenever you can. Now, isn't that interesting? Evangelism, page 141. Agree with the people on every point where you can consistently do so. Let them see you love their souls and you want to be in harmony with them as far as possible. Now, does she say to agree with error? She didn't say that. She said agree on every point where what? Where you're able to do so. So in other words, don't start with differences. Start with what? What you have in common. Because if you start with differences, what's going to happen? The wall is going to go up. How much time do you enjoy spending with someone who always tells you where you're wrong? You don't. We avoid people like that. And, and so th this is a change of paradigm for some of us. Because some, for some of us, our paradigm of evangelism is, oh, I've got to throw out verses and I've got to show them where they're wrong. I've got to show them what truth is. But she actually says, start with what you have in common. Start with what you can agree on so you can build trust and you can build a friendship. That's the science of soul winning. If that makes sense, can you say amen? amen? Now, there are times where you don't have control. Someone may directly ask you a question. Well, why don't you go to church on Sunday? Why do you go on Sabbath? Well, you can't really avoid that. Someone is, someone is giving you a question. So you answer the question. But when it's within your control... She says, start with what you have in common and agree with people as much as you can do so. And when I'm doing an evangelistic meeting, and maybe someone comes to me early on and they have a question, and they say something to me that I know is not correct. You know, maybe it's only the fourth night, and someone comes up and talks to me about how their loved one died and they're so glad they're in heaven. Do you think I stop right there on night number four and say, oh, ma'am, let me correct you on something. <laughs> No, because I, I'm still building the friendship. You just simply listen and you smile. Because I know that subject's going to come up a little bit later. They're not ready right now. This is a chance for me to connect. And I know that's hard for some of us because for some of us, you've got a thousand verses going through your mind and you want to tell them this one and that one. Start with what you have in common. There, there is a reason. So now you're going to practice it because I'm going to give you a hypothetical example. I'd like you to take 60 seconds and talk to the person around you. And I would like you to pretend that your Baptist friend has just said to you, oh, I can't wait for the rapture to happen. And what they mean by that is, you know, a secret rapture where you're snatched away and then, you know, uh, planes crash and buses crash because people were snatched away and there's seven years of tribulation. Obviously, as Adventists, we don't believe it that way. But what is something you can say here that starts with what you have in common, what you can agree on? I'm going to give you 60 seconds to talk about this. I know it's going to be hard for some of us because you're thinking, okay, all those verses about, you know, Jesus coming, the lightning flashes across the sky, all those things are going to come across your mind. Refrain from it. What is something you can say that starts with what you have in common? You have 60 seconds.
Okay, what'd you come up with? I don't know if that was really 60 seconds or not, but you know, in real life, you don't have 60 seconds to think about it anyway. So would some of you be willing to share? What did your, what did your group talk about? What could you possibly say here? Okay, I am also looking forward for the coming of Christ. Can he say that as a Seventh-day Adventist? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Is that agreeing with error? No. no, it's not agreeing with error. He's finding what they have in common. Yeah. They're both looking forward to Jesus coming. You just think it happens in different ways. Okay, other hands I saw. So you, you just kindly listen and smile. Yeah. Yes. You don't have to say anything if you can't think of saying anything. You just listen and smile. Anybody else? Tell me more. Okay, so you, you would listen. You would listen more. And that's important too because listening is also a big part of soul winning. We think soul winning is talking. It's actually more about listening. Because if you don't listen... You, you, you don't know where they're coming from. You don't know how you can help them if I don't listen. Over here, there were hands. Yes. Okay, you would talk about being ready. Okay, okay. Hands over here. Me too. Okay, because rapture simply means to be caught up. So you could say me too. Okay. You're going to safe route. That's cool. Anybody else? Let me share with you what some other groups have said. So, so similar to what you said. I'm looking forward to meeting Jesus too. Can I say that as a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm looking forward to heaven as well. Or, yeah, I believe the end is very soon. Am I agreeing with error in any of those statements? No. I'm finding what we have in common. I'm starting with what we can agree upon. Th does that make sense? All right, let's do another one. No, not that one. This one. Because someone always says to me, oh, that actually happened to me. Your friend says to you at a funeral, I'm so happy my husband is walking the streets of gold. What can you say that's not controversial, that actually starts with what you have in common? So I'm going to give you another 60 seconds on this one to be able to discuss it and see what you come up with. Y'all talking about this, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, what did you come up with? What could you say here that starts with what you have in common, what you can agree with? So come on, I know y'all were talking about something. I hope you were talking about this. <laughs> what can you say here? Okay, I can't wait to walk in the streets of gold too. Can I say that as a Seventh-day Adventist? Of course I can. Am I agreeing with error? I'm not. So that, that would be a, gr a great thing to say. What else? Say it again. Oh, heaven will be a beautiful place. Can I say that? 
I can. Because I, I'm purposely avoiding controversy at this point. Because I'm starting with what I have in common. Besides, if you try to throw a few verses out at this point, <laughs> when emotions are high, probably not going to go real well. Time will come later. Because think about it, in, in most of the Christian world's mind, okay, there's two options when you die, okay? It's up or down. So if you're telling them, okay, well, he's not up, what are they hearing in their minds? They must be down. Okay, so this is not going to be the place to talk about this. Can you think of anything else? Oh, I, we are looking forward to being reunited with our loved ones. Can I say that? Absolutely. Not agreeing with error, something we have in common. Here's, here's what some other groups have said. I'm glad the death isn't the end for the Christian. Can I say that? Because as Adventists, we don't believe death is the end. We believe it's just a temporary sleep. I'm sure you're looking forward to being reunited one day. One of you already said that. I can understand why you feel that way. Now, I, I, I want to talk about that one for a moment. Can you understand that statement? I understand why you feel that way. I'm not agreeing with it. But can you understand why someone would find it comforting to think that their loved one is in heaven who doesn't know the truth? I understand why they would think that it comforting. I don't agree with it, but I can understand why that they would think that way. Because I recognize they don't understand, they don't understand truth just yet. Or what my sister said earlier, if you can't think of anything to say, you don't have to fake it. Just silence and smile. If someone, a lot of times if someone says something I don't agree with and I, and I know it's not time to give them truth yet, I'm, I just smile and say, I see. I see. <laughs> now, I probably shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> because now if you ever talk to me somewhere and I say, oh, I see, you'll know I disagree with you. <laughs> you say, I see. You don't, you don't even have to say whether you agree or disagree. You know, there's that saying that says silence is golden. And sometimes silence is good when it comes to soul winning. Now there's no way we're going to do two sessions. So I'm just going to I'm just going to take longer on the first session. Is that okay? And we'll spend a lot, a lot more time on it. Even though this is not what I would normally talk about at this point can I share something with you that I have found to be helpful at this point when helping people to understand why sleeping in the grave is better? than being in heaven. Because think about it. Logically, when you're sharing these things, think about it. You're saying, well, the Bible says we sleep in the grave. Well, the average person is thinking, okay, and, and how is being in the dirt better than being in heaven right now? Because they don't understand that. And can you understand why they wouldn't understand that? So what we usually do is tell a story up front, and now you can, you can work this if you were one-on-one. -on -one. So I don't, I don't know how else to do this except to tell the story like you're the audience, okay? And then you can, you can change it and work it in a, in a personal way. So let's say we were doing a series that might say something like this. My friends, tonight you've learned this beautiful truth that God says we, we get to sleep and we rest in the grave until Jesus comes and, and sin can't hurt us, sin can't touch us anymore. But you might be thinking, but Pastor Dave, that takes my joy away. I always pictured my loved one as being up in heaven and, and looking down upon me with loving eyes. And, and now you're saying the Bible says that, that he's still in the grave. Pastor, that takes my joy away. I wish I hadn't come tonight. I, I wish I'd never heard this. Well, friends, I can understand why you might feel that way. But let's just think for a second. God's way is always the best way. I know it's comforting to us to think of our loved one being in heaven right now. But the truth is, would they actually be happy? Would they actually be happy looking down upon all the things happening in this world? Seeing the suffering their family's going through, maybe a wayward child who's walking away from Jesus and they can't do anything about it. Would they really be happy looking down on that? Now to illustrate it, I want to give you a story and I want us to pretend something tonight. Let's pretend that tonight after the meeting, when I'm on my way home, I'm involved in a tragic accident and I die in a fatal accident. Now, I'm not planning for that to happen. Let's just, let's just pretend it happens, okay? And let's say I'm a good guy, so when I die, I go to heaven. 
And now I'm looking down on everything that transpires afterwards. And so I watch. I watch as the police officer goes to the door of my home in the middle of the night. As he knocks on the door. And my wife comes to the door sleepy-eyed and surprised. And I listen as he tells my wife that her husband was involved in a fatal car accident and that he has died. And I watch as she collapses to the ground in shock, just sobbing and crying hysterically at the officer's feet. But that's okay, because I'm happy in heaven. The next morning I watch as my girls get ready to go to school. And Marquita pulls them to the side and says, Honeys, you're not going to school today. Why not, Mom? Why not, Mommy? You see, Daddy died last night. He was in, he was in a car accident. He's, he's not coming home and and I watch my girls just weep and cry in tears because they realize they don't have a daddy anymore. But I'm happy in heaven. Time passes. I look down and I watch the funeral that's taking place. I watch my 94-year-old father and mother just sitting there, sitting there in the chair and just weeping and crying because children aren't supposed to die before their parents. But I'm happy in heaven. I watch my wife go up to the casket and lay her warm hand on my cold, lifeless hand. With tears streaming down her face, I hear her say, David, I loved you. I don't know how I'm going to make it without you. But I'm happy in heaven. As they get ready to close the casket and they let the family in for one last time, I watch my girls uh, look over at my, at my body and as the Marquita tries to pull, pull my little daughter away and she screams out, why doesn't daddy talk? Why doesn't daddy answer me anymore? But I'm happy in heaven. Time passes. As Marquita goes through the grieving process, I watch. I watch her work two jobs trying to make ends meet. I watch her, I'm making myself cry. <laughs> my, my girls hate when I tell the story because it makes them cry. I, I watch as my wife cries herself to sleep each night because she's lonely. She's hurting. She doesn't have her partner anymore. But that's okay because I'm happy in heaven. I watch my girls waking up in the middle of the night having nightmares because they miss their daddy. It's affecting their school. It's affecting their lives. But I'm happy in heaven. Time passes. Eventually I watch as Marquita gets over the grieving process. And then I begin to see <laughs> another man <laughs> coming into her life. I watch another man hold her hand. I watch another man kiss her lips. I hear her say, I love you to another man. Words that were once reserved for me. But I'm happy in heaven. <laughs> I watch. And let's get real. I watch as they're intimate in bed together. But I'm happy in heaven. And I watch as slowly but surely my pictures are taken down off the mantle and replaced with somebody else's. But I'm happy in heaven. Friends, I ask you, would I be happy? I would not be happy. I would be miserable. And God knows that. That's why God allows us to sleep, to rest in the grave, because sin can't hurt us. It can't touch us anymore. God protects us from the pain of sin. And then when Jesus comes again and we rise, then we all walk into the kingdom together. That's why God's way is the best way. Can you say amen? amen. If you tell a story like that, even if it's just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, when people hear that, it gives them a reason, helps them to understand, oh, that's why being in the grave is better. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. And of course, eventually then when they learn about spiritualism and things like that, that adds another component. But you've got to give them a reason. You've got to show them practically why God's way is better. Because on the surface, it does seem like being in heaven would be better. On the surface. But you've you, you got to give practical stories. Now, that's not normally what I do here. That's only because we have extra time since we're just doing the first section. Okay, second one. Never criticize or condemn. Now, I know you're probably thinking, you know, I didn't need to drive all the way to a seminar to hear that one. That's kind of common sense. That's elementary. 
But have you ever noticed the principles that are most elementary are the ones we seem to have the most difficulty actually doing? See, when it comes to someone I'm working with, criticism and condemnation never wins anybody. It will not win a soul to Christ. It will repel them. What I need to do is I'm looking to build them up. I'm trying to acknowledge the good in them. Because though we all are born with a sinful heart, there is still some good in each person because God's Spirit still strives with each person. Does that make sense? I want someone who's going to see the good in me. Now, if I'm working with someone that doesn't know Jesus, friend, co-worker, neighbor, are they going to perhaps have things in their life that I just don't understand? Are they going to be making decisions that I, j I just don't get it? Could they have addictions that I might even think are disgusting? They could be killing themselves, hurting their family. There are going to be things I just don't understand. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why would this person do this? But see, that's what it means to work with someone. Because the truth is, how often does God look down on us and he wonders, why can't David see that? Why, why, why doesn't Elvis get it? Why, why doesn't Susie understand? God looks down on us and with his ultimate patience, he still looks for the good in us. So I want to never criticize or condemn. Now, you may be saying, okay, but Pastor Dave, isn't there a time? Isn't there a time when you've got to sit down and be straight with people? There is a time. But I'm talking about destructive criticism here. And destructive criticism is when you criticize without relationship. You haven't earned the right to do that. Constructive criticism comes from a friend who over time has earned your love, earned your trust. You've got to earn the right to say those things like we talked about before. I'll give you an example. When I was a teenager growing up in church, I remember I was asked to be a deacon, or they may have called it a junior deacon at that time. And so I agreed, and I remember that one Sabbath it was my turn to take up the offering. And of course, we all realize a deacon's job is a whole lot more than just taking up an offering, okay? But it was my turn to take up the offering. And so that Sabbath, I came to church without a suit coat and tie. I was dressed nice, probably like this, just without a tie and suit coat. And after church, one of the dear old ladies of the church came up to me and said, David, I don't think it was very appropriate that you took up the offering without your tie and your suit coat on. I don't think that was a good idea. Now, how do you think I responded? You would think I would have been upset, but I actually wasn't. You know why? Because this was a lady who had always taken an interest in my life. She always showed love for me. Whenever I would come to church, she'd say, I've been praying for you this week, David. How are you doing? She would say, how's school going for you? If I had a girlfriend, she'd ask how my girlfriend was doing. She always took an interest in me. And so because of that, I took what she said in the right way. I didn't agree with her, but I wasn't offended because she earned the right to be able to say something like that. And she did it in a nice, loving way. Now, if that had come from someone who never took an interest in me, never paid attention to me, and the only time they ever talked to me is when they thought I was doing something wrong, yes, my response would have been totally different. Because they didn't earn the right to be able to do that. Does that make sense? So never criticize or condemn. So I, I love this quote. Not that quote, the one that's supposed to come up. This one. Your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments as upon your ability to find your way to the heart. Now, that's the same thing as friendship. It's not upon your knowledge. It is not, it's not upon you've been in the church 50 years or you've got all these verses and doctrines memorized. And don't get me wrong. It's important that we know why we believe what we believe and we should be able to defend it from the Bible. Don't get me wrong. But what she is saying is my success in soul winning isn't simply about the knowledge I have in my head. It's about finding your way to the heart. And you don't have to have a Ph.D. to do that. You don't have to be a pastor to do that. You can be a simple, average, ordinary layperson, but you know how to connect 
with a person's heart. That is the key to being a soul winner for Jesus. And if you look at the Gospels, that's exactly what made Jesus' ministry successful. Because he went where the Pharisees won. They were preachers from a distance. Jesus ate in people's homes. He sat down with them by the mountainside. Small groups by the seashore. He met someone at night. He walked, along, he walked along the way and answered questions and talked with people. He healed them and took them into his arms. Those were all things Pharisees would not do. Because it involved getting close to people. It involved getting your hands dirty, so to speak. It involved uncomfortable situations. And they used the excuse, oh, I'm not supposed to be of the world. I've got to keep myself righteous and uncorrupted from this sin-stained world. And while some of that may be true, we can take that to an extreme. We can actually use it as an excuse to not fulfill the Gospel Commission. They say, well, Pastor Dave, aren't there times the Bible does say be careful who your compatriots are and your associates? Well, of course, because there's a balance. And maybe the question I need to ask is, when it gets to the point where they are more of a bad influence on me than I am a good influence on them, then maybe that's the point where maybe I need to step back a little bit. But it doesn't mean I ignore the people of the world. See, this is why we have a daily devotional life. Because that daily devotional life and spending time with Jesus each day, that's what strengthens me to be able to interact with the people of the world. But if I don't have that daily devotional life, then yes, I leave myself open to being influenced by wrong. Th does that make sense? See, a soul winner spends time with Jesus every day. Because you're not going to win a soul by yourself. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit wants to use you. Principle number three, accept people where they are. That is probably the most misunderstood evangelistic principle in the church today. Because as soon as I put that up there, I guarantee you, there is somebody saying to themselves, oh, accept people where they are. Okay, so now everything goes. The standards are just out the door. We're just supposed to accept everything. Is that what that principle means? That's not what it means. It says accept people where they are. In other words, this is where Johnny is right now, okay? He's not where God wants him to be. He's making poor choices. I don't agree with his lifestyle and the things that he's doing, but I've got to accept this is where Johnny is right now. This is where I have to work with him. And I've got two choices. I can either say, well, I don't want nothing to do with any of that stuff. And we can all go the other way. And then how will Johnny ever come to know Jesus? Or I can say, okay, Lord, I don't agree with this stuff. But this is where he is right now. So I'm going to choose to be his friend, walk with him. And I'm going to pray and wait for you to do something in his life. But I'm going to be there. I can't do the stuff he does. But I'm at least going to be his friend. Because this is where he is right now. Are you following me? See, we accept people where they are. But God doesn't want people to stay where they are. But I can't expect them to turn around before I'm willing to be friends and to engage with them. Does that make sense? Now, I'm, I'm going to love them in spite of who they are. I'm going to be their friend despite their bad habits, despite their addictions. Now, I'm not foolish. We live in a crazy world. We, we, we have things happening in the world today that weren't happening 10, 20 years ago. We have crazy stuff. So I, I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that, yes, every situation is absolutely clearly black and white. There are some gray areas. There are some things that are confusing in this world. We will face situations where we're just we're not sure what to do or how to handle it. And I don't have to go into detail as to what those things are. I think we all realize we just live in a messed up world and there are people that are just wanting to mess things up more. But you know, that's why we have the Holy Spirit. Show us, Lord, how, how do we handle this? 
I, 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 we want to uphold truth, but Lord, we don't want this person to, to be lost or to be away from you. So Lord, please show us how do we balance this. And it takes prayer. Because there are just weird things in this world. So let's give an example. Let's give a hypothetical example. Um, ho hopefully this hasn't happened here. If it has, then we'll just take this as a Holy Spirit moment because I have no idea what's happened in your church. So let's pretend. Let's pretend that there's a teenage girl and she makes a mistake one night. She goes a little too far with her boyfriend. They can't control themselves and she ends up pregnant. Her family is going to go through a time because they're going to be having to discuss, okay, what do we do? How do we handle this? And we're talking about church family, people, people in the church. What do we do? And they struggle through this. People try to work with them. Let's say a few months later, there's a board meeting. And someone in the board meeting says, why don't we have a baby shower for this girl? I promise you there will be two schools of thought. There will be one school that says, no way, we can't show, throw a baby shower. That will be like we're condoning the act and we can't send that message to the other young people. And there will be another group that says, I, I don't see a problem with a baby shower. What's done is done. We need to show this girl, we, we need to help this girl become a Christian mother long before she was expecting to. And to be, to be honest, both sides have some good points to consider. So how would we apply this principle except where they are? Now I'll tell you, for me, now you don't have to agree with me because this may be one of those gray areas. This is just how I would see it. For me personally, and your culture may be different, I wouldn't have a problem with the baby shower. Because for me, that would be, okay, accepting this is where they are right now. I can't change the past. I can't change what happened. All I know is that if I want this girl to stay within the realm of the church, she is now going to be a mother long before she ever expected. And we want to help her be a Christian mother. And so we're going to provide a baby shower to help with some of the things she's going to practically need. That's how I would see it. Does it mean I agree with what she did? It doesn't mean that I'm saying it's biblical or that others should do it. It means that, okay, this is where she is right now. We can't change that. How can we help her from this point on and help bring her back to Jesus? To me, that's part of the principle of accepting this is where they are right now. Now, again, I don't mean to get discussion about it. If people see it differently, that, that's fine. There's all different sorts of situations. But somehow, by God's grace, we have to figure out what is the difference between condoning something and just accepting okay, this is where the person is right now. Because I can't expect them to change their habits or their choices or their lifestyle. I can't expect them to change that before I have engaged in their life for Jesus to work on their heart. What did Jesus say? He says, come to me as you are. Because change doesn't happen outside of Jesus. If change happens before we come to Jesus, then that means it's change of our own will and effort which is not going to last. But if I come to Him with all my mess, then God can do something. And the truth is, we could all say, well, man, I don't want to get involved with that. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. <laughs> well, I know some people object and they, they say, well, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't change a human heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Now that is true. I can't change a human heart. But you realize God has set up the gospel commission to where God uses people to win other people. God has not designed for us to just sit on the backslide and say, well, you know, when the Holy Spirit wants to, He will. See, you and I grow by getting involved in someone else's life. That's how you and I grow as Christians. And so God gives me the privilege of being used by Him as imperfect as I am with all my own faults and weaknesses. God uses me 
to somehow make a difference in the life of another. And it blesses that person. And to be honest, it blesses me too. Say amen. Principles. And I leave you with this quote. It's kind of a long quote, but I just think it's... Um, I don't know any other quote that answers this question better of how do you balance the idea of being in the world but not being of the world. So I'm just going to read this quote from, from Desire of Ages. And then since we actually have like 15 extra minutes, let's just throw it out for, let's just throw out for questions. This is what she says. The example of Christ in linking himself with the interests of humanity should be followed by all who preach his word and by all who have received the gospel of his grace. So who, who has received the gospel, excuse me, of his grace? Just pastors? All of us. We are not to renounce social communion. We should not seclude ourselves from others. In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. They will seldom seek us of their own accord. Not alone from the pulpit are the hearts of men touched by divine truth, but there is another field of labor. Humbler it may be, but fully as promising. And then she names what that field of labor is. It is found in the home of the lowly, in the mansion of the great, at the hospitable board, I think that means the dinner table, and in the gatherings of innocent social enjoyment. Now then comes the next, the next paragraph, and unfortunately, this is the one paragraph that so many people quote, but they never quote the paragraphs above it. They, they totally quote it out of context. You've probably heard it before. As disciples of Christ, we shall not mingle with the world for a mere love of pleasure, to unite with them in folly. Such association can only result in harm. We should never give sanction to sin by our words or our deeds, our silence or our presence. Now, if I only quote that paragraph, I could take that to the extreme. But when I realize what the context is and what the balance of that statement is, I get a little more of a balanced view. Does that make sense? And then she goes on to say, wherever we go, we are to carry Jesus with us and to reveal to others the preciousness of our Savior. But those who try to preserve their religion by hiding it within stone walls lose precious opportunities of doing good. Through the social relations, Christianity comes in contact with the world. And then she ends by saying, Social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests. Isn't that a powerful quote? When you read those four or five paragraphs together, that's probably the most balanced statement that I think I've ever read. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests. So let me leave you with some websites, if I can find the website. These are some websites with some other resources on it that you can look at, that you can 